Good morning, Pastor Paul here. Welcome you to Grace Point for worship. Got a few announcements I want to run before you before we jump into our worship. But it is part of our body life, which is part of worship itself. So stay informed. There's your Grace Point. You can get on text in the word there. We got Facebook. You can follow us there as well. And you can visit our website. So please just take notice of those on the screen and not get a hold of us. Check us out. See what's going on. We'll remind all our people that we have to give online right now. You can mail your checks in too, but most of you will probably use an online app. So please, there's, there's how to give using Simple Give. As well, as I want you to remember, after the service, go to the Zoom group. We have three you can pick from. You can participate. Connect with the body of Christ the best you can through that virtual reality. And may the Lord bless you as you spend time together. And we are glad you're here with us online. Would you pray with me? Father, we commit our time to you. It's our desire to worship you. It's our desire to receive from you. That We're here to entertain you, not ourselves. You said you seek people to worship you. In spirit and truth, and we come in the name of Jesus for that purpose today. Amen. Here's a call to worship comes from Psalm 47 and Ephesians 4. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For Jesus has ascended with shouts of triumph and trumpet fanfare. He is exalted on high, sovereign over all the nations, and Lord of our lives. Let us worship together.
the trumpet sound Oh, may I then in him be found in his righteousness alone fall this stand before the throne
Amen. It's good news. Sweet, sweet news. That Jesus would come and love us and save us. Father, we thank you for Christ, the Messiah who came to be amongst sinners, to rescue us from our sin, and to bring us home, and to bring us in relationship with you, Lord. Thank you, God, that we have this time to worship you, even still amongst all the mess that is uh, our nation and our world right now. Uh, your name is still being lifted high across the world and right here this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let's go before the Lord now. And what I call the confession of faith in the gospel, it's just not looking and wallowing over our sins. It's looking at the glory of Christ, who is the forgiver of all sins, who because of his love for us invites us that we know we will receive into the holy of holies before the living God because of his intercession, because of his work of grace. So it's a confession, yes, that we see often there's things still needing to be done in us. But it's also a confession that Christ makes it possible to be healed and cleansed from it. So would you follow me in this confession of faith? Almighty God, we come to you in, the, come to you in sorrow for our sins and to humbly confess to you our unbelief. While we know and believe that Jesus died for us on the cross and that he was raised from the dead, we admit it often makes little difference in our lives. Forgive us, we pray. Enable us to fully embrace the truth of the gospel, that our love for you may flourish, that our obedience may be wholehearted and joyful, and that our witness may be more courageous. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and triumphant Lord. Amen. Hear the assurance from the Word of God. He says, The Lord is faithful to all his words. He's gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Uh, we're going to continue to worship in song and in giving. This is the time where we come together as a body and uh, virtually. And uh, we give to God what is already his. And uh, it's such a beautiful opportunity to say, Lord, I trust you with my life, with my family, with our home, even during these uncertain times. Uh, it's a step towards um, removing obstacles and barriers to fully trusting and, and believing the God of the universe has you in his grasp and he loves you. So it's a beautiful opportunity that we get to give. And um, so I just encourage you all to go to Simple Give and uh, take that step. Uh, we're going to sing a song, um, but feel free to, to go do that now.
Thank you for that music. Thank you for worshiping with us. At this time, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Take a few minutes together. Pray about some people you know, people, situations you're familiar with. And uh, let's just pray. Look into the Lord with thanksgiving as well. We've worshiped him with song. He called us to worship. We've come and sung songs to him. We've confessed sins. We've recognized he is the Lord of our lives. And now's the time to enter into thanksgiving and praying and petition on, on others' behalf. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you remembering right now your goodness and grace to us in Christ. And even as you've called us to be worshipers, our prayer is that you will continue to seek people throughout the earth to be worshipers of the living God. And that includes our family members, co-workers, friends, that person down the street we don't even know that well. Give us a heart to want that more and more. We pray for those family members who are sick right now, or maybe they're just sick with fear and anxiety. We pray you would work in their hearts and assure them of your peace. We pray for those who are struggling, having to go to work situations, or maybe not even able to work. That's even more difficult. To, where's the money going to come from? how we're going to get through the next week, nevertheless the next month. Once again, Father, you know their needs. You promise that. And that you will provide their needs. At the same time, we pray for opening up our eyes to see those needs and being part of the body of Christ and help ministering to them. We certainly are asking you to protect people at this time as they're being exposed to the virus or don't even know if they're being exposed. We pray for them. Pray for everyone that they would see your hand of mercy at this time. We thank you, Lord, that 
you haven't forgotten us. You're sovereign, enthroned on your kingdom throne, ministering your will throughout all the earth. We do pray that people will continue to hear your call. Father, there's things in our lives that we'd want to lift up to you, that we want to see them removed. We want to see an improvement in them. And we know in and of ourselves we're incapable of doing that. But by your grace and your spirit, you can make us overcomers. Paul said, I was weak so that I might know more of your grace. And I'm going to boast in my weakness because of Christ strength is in me these are all part of the joy and the gifts that we receive because of your resurrection and your ascension to the throne of heaven hear our prayers on behalf of jesus we're going to be looking at the ascension of jesus this morning out of acts 1 also luke 24 a little bit before i jump into it though i'd like to just make mention that how many of you have celebrated Ascension Day? Typically in the church calendar, it comes 40 days after Jesus is resurrection, so they push it down. I think it's May 21st, a Thursday this year. Uh, there's not many celebrations of the Ascension Day. There aren't, and one good thing about it is the world hasn't stolen it yet. You know, we do Easter and Christmas, two of our great holiday celebrations of Christ, but they've already come in with the commercialism, they've come in with the materialism, and they distract us. But the Ascension Day, I mean, what do you do about someone flying out of Earth? Well, how, how do they take that and make that their holiday? One of the, the, the Ascension Day is just as essential as the resurrection, as essential as the crucifixion, as crucial as the incarnation of Christ. Yet I think we probably don't give it near the attention that scripture gives to it. Luke has about 25% of, of his writings of the New Testament is inclusive of this ascension. It's huge. Some of the other gospels don't even cover it much. And it's huge because of what it means for Christ and what it means for us because we're in Christ. And I'm going to try to touch on some of this today. It's too much for one sermon. I could probably break down one of the five or six, seven of the implications, and we could spend just all our time on that. But I won't. I'm going to keep it, run it through it to you, set it you up for it. The joy of looking through Scripture, Jesus sat with the disciples. He came, to, he came with them. Let's look over to Luke 24. I want you to see what he says to him in Luke 24. Got your Bibles? I can't hear them turning. Ah, there you go. They're getting them now. Get your Bible. Join me at Luke 24. And this is after just as Jesus has joined the disciples. Yeah. I'm going to stop while y'all look up Luke 24 and get to verse 45. And I'm going to remind you. Some people call what happened after Jesus' resurrection the Easter effect. That's, that's what a lot of people use to describe what happened and how everything changed and how the new church started. And I mentioned a lot of that last week. I'm going to argue a little bit today that it was the ascension effect is what you see happening in the book of Acts. Because up to this point, you will see, even though Jesus is resurrected that day on the, in the 24th chapter, he's already met Mary and the other Marys. He's on the road to Damascus. He meets those guys. Then he disappears, just vanishes from them. He appears again to the disciples. <coughs> they were behind closed doors, locked away. They were sheltered at home. They were fearful for their lives, just like people are fearful for their lives right now. They weren't running around doing much. They were trying to stay in hiding. If you might remember, even in the, in the garden to, when Jesus was arrest, uh, arrested, they fought back just a little bit, and then they just scattered. One of them scattered, lost his clothes. He tried to get away so fast. Only a couple of them were even at the crucifixion or outside when the trials were going on. <clears throat> These disciples were hiding away. Jesus shows up, and this is, the, this is where we're at in the Gospel of Luke. 
he appears to them and he starts talking to them. And then verse, let's pick it up 44. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you're clothed with power on high. So if you will, Luke, it gives you the, the premier, and then he gives you in Acts he gives us the sequel. And the sequel is, is every bit as good as the premiere. It is glorious. It's Christ exalting. In one sense, we've studied more of his humanity, God man, the perfect man. And what difference does that make? It's huge. It's huge. It's that story of the fallenness of man that the first Adam failed to do what we needed him to do. And the fall took place and death came in and sin and evil, all kinds of darkness, if you will. And then there was that promise there'd be a redeemer to come. There'd be one to rescue us, the Messiah. That was part of the disciples' problem is they had a conception of what the Messiah would be. And so when Jesus shows up, they're all looking, are you the Messiah, are you the Messiah, are you the Messiah, are you the Messiah? Over and over. And hey, when you come into your throne room, when you're the king, can I sit on your right? Can I sit on your left? I want to be a part of this. And they didn't understand that his kingdom was already here, but they were thinking of a physical kingdom. And Christ says, the kingdom is within you. I've set my throne on your heart. So we still see them a little... I mean, they're out fishing when Jesus goes to find Peter again. He's already restored him, but now he's going to commission him for a mission. And he finds him. Where's he at? He's on a fishing boat. They didn't, they didn't know what to do. They just said, Jesus is here. Jesus is he's risen. Praise God. He, he keeps showing up occasionally for the next 40 days. But then there's this twist in the plot. You get to the end of this chapter and the end of Matthew, Jesus is going to say, I'm leaving. But before I leave you, I've given you a mission. So we turn now with me to Acts chapter 1. Flip on over a few pages, a few chapters. And let's read how he writes. Luke now writes, often called the Acts of the Apostles. The reality is, it's the acts of Jesus Christ through his church. He's still alive. He's still working. He is alive forevermore, scripture says. Listen to what he says. In the first book, in the premier, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, here they go again, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They just, they're not there yet, are they? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. 
But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go to heaven. May God bless our understanding of the word. There's so much in just this. Uh, we're not going to get there. It's too good. I mean, it's the same wide eye, mouth open, gasping and awe when they saw him resurrected and can't really believe their eyes. They're staring up and they're not just staring into the heavens. They didn't use the word heavens. He used the word heaven. They actually got a glimpse of heaven, a dimension, a, a, a place, a mode of existence we have a hard time grasping. It is an abode. It is a place. Matter of fact, Jesus told him beforehand, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions, a place for you, so that where I am, you may be also a place for you. I'm going there. But I want you to capture the glory of this, that Christ did not go back into his state of exaltation like he came in his humiliation. He left the throne of glory and came here to be a man. That is his humiliation. And then he lived a life in this state of humiliation. The cross was certainly humiliating. But now he's going to be exalted, but not just as the Christ that came before, but as Christ the God-man, the glorified man. This is significant for you and me. You got to go read the rest of Hebrews and spend your time going through Hebrews to grasp the significance of that statement. That he goes as the God-man into the presence of God as our new Adam, having accomplished the will of God. And he's going to sit down because he's finished doing the work he was sent to do. And he's going to take on his other roles, the same roles he has here when he's walking among his disciples. He's a priest to them. Presenting God to him, presenting him to God. He's a king. He's ruling in their hearts already. He's a, he's a prophet declaring the word of God. We just read how he declared the word of God to him. Opened up their eyes to the scripture to learn about him. He continues that in heaven. Now, this is for us. There ought to be as much joy about Christ ascending to the throne room of God as it is of the resurrection and the incarnation, Christmas. It is paramount that he says, I must fulfill scripture. I have to return to my father. I want to be back in the glory the father had. I want my people to have that same glory. You and I are going to be exalted with Christ. Other scriptures say you and I are already. By our union in Christ. Seated. Ephesians. In glory. I, I can't grasp that. I, I believe it. I don't know how it works and functions all the time, but I'm in him and he is in me. So all that it belongs to Christ belongs to me. That is a mind warp. I cannot wrap myself around that. And part of affinity with him, part of being living with him forever is him to extrapolate and delineate all what that means. It means him. And I'm in him. And he's exalted and glorified. And I get to do that too. I get to sit. The very thing the disciples wanted, one day you and I will get. We'll get to sit with him. You wanted to walk like, everybody wants to go to Jerusalem, right? When we talked about that last week, see an empty tomb. A lot of people want to go see where Jesus walked. They want to go to the river and step in the river. Uh, I, someone went and got me some water from the Jordan River. It's filthy looking stuff. 
It's not clean and pure. Listen, people say, well, I, I just want to go experience where Jesus walked. Listen, you're going to get to walk with him one day. He's going to recreate this whole earth, and he, we're going to abide here with him. You're going to walk around with him. It's better than going to an empty place where maybe he walked, maybe he slept, maybe he ate, ate there. Jesus ate here in that restaurant. No, you're going you're to be able to commune with him. <clears throat> in the meantime, we commune by the Spirit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Listen, Jesus, resurrection, ascension, and what we'll call his enthronement. He's enthroned now. He takes the sacrifice. And that, you know, poor Mary, you know, she ran up to him and grabbed his, started hugging him and said, whoa. That's Paul Owen's paraphrase. That he said, I haven't ascended to the Father yet. What he was communicating was, Mary, I'm going to leave again. And, but I have to because there's so much more it's going to take place when I do that. You want me right now locally. You want me here so you can hold me. But you need to let that go. There's more. There's so much more. So when I ascend to the Father, I'm going to send, I'm going to talk to the Dad. Because he said, I'm going to talk to the Father and we're going to send the Spirit. This is part of the plan. This was part of the mission a long time ago before the foundation of the world. We worked this out and I'm going to send the Spirit to you and then he's going to abide in you and I'm going to, my presence will be in all believers. They can commune with me. They can talk with me. They can embrace me by faith. She didn't understand that, I'm sure, at first. The disciples didn't understand that at first. Because, again, we find them twice. Once in hiding behind closed doors. Second, hiding behind closed doors. Even now, when you're going to set up your kingdom right now, is this when you're going to bring in the army? Hey, who can beat a king who can't die? Come on, I want to be on your team, Jesus. Yeah, yeah this is makes a good, I, I love this resurrection thing you've done. That means nobody can kill you. Let's go, man. Let's set up your kingdom. And he says, that's not it. I'm going to come in my power of the Spirit. I'm going to continue to Build my kingdom in the hearts of men and women and children. What joy that is. So he continues his work after, he said he began. That's the word signals that Jesus does not mark the cessation. He began to do, verse 1, and to teach. He's still teaching. He's still the prophet declaring his word to us as we read it. Matter of fact, when you and I share the word of God with someone, it's as if Jesus has spoken it to them. That's dynamic. You don't have to worry about whether you convince them of it. The Spirit is working with the Word of God to convince them of it. You can relax and just enjoy the process of watching Him change a heart, it's planting the seed of the Spirit in them. You can watch them as they struggle, as the different kingdoms in them are fighting against the Spirit, and the Spirit is just coming over. Jesus told His disciples, Said very simply, the gates of hell won't prevail against it. The kingdom is coming. I will establish my church. He establishes his church by people. And he rules over the church. So he's going to send his Holy Spirit, he said. <clears throat> Matter of fact, Peter starts his sermon there in the Pentecost sermon. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourself are seeing and hearing. When the Spirit fell in chapter 2, you'll read, the Pentecost, we call it Pentecost, the promise is fulfilled by exalted, heavenly enthroned Savior Jesus Christ, God-man, for his people. See, God, the God remembers his covenant of love. He says, I, I'll never break my covenant of love with you. I've, I've given Jesus to keep that covenant seal it. I've given the Spirit as earnest of it. You will be my people, and I will be your God was his promise. With that comes a great joy of knowing you're not going to fall short of the glory of God. 
That's one of the benefits of Christ being in heaven right now is he's promised, I'll keep you. I know you're weak. I know you're but dust. I know what it's like. I've lived there with you. I've seen all the horrors you have to live with, the oppression. As a matter of fact, I kind of liken it to the Lord of Rings, you know, that trilogy there with Tolkien writes. There's a mission. There's a mission to be given. We've all got a purpose and a mission. But to accomplish that mission, we need a fellowship. We can't do it on our own. No man's an island himself. You and I need each other. We're relational, just like the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son. They're all relationship, a community. You and I need that. That's why some people are struggling so much right now. They're not getting quite the community they had before. And it's hard to make it exist in this viral world, you might say, virtual world. Plus, other people in the world don't have this community. And they're searching for it now in a way they never searched. So you got a mission. You need a community. But guess what? There's an ever-present evil always seeking to keep you from accomplishing your mission. So you need a hero. You need a leader. You need some gifts. You need some tools. And that's what Paul says over in Ephesians. He said, God has given us, Christ has ascended. And with him, he took the captives. So first he took the captives out of the throne room of the evil one. He said, now you're going to be my people. You're going to be my witnesses. In the Old Testament, whenever you defeated one of the enemies that you were fighting with, you would take their statue of their God. That's why when you read the Philistines, when they disobeyed God by taking the Ark of the Covenant into battle, they weren't supposed to do that. It wasn't for that. They lost the battle. Philistines take them and set the Ark of the Covenant among all the other gods' statues that they had defeated, the people they had defeated, and put it before their God. Well, you know the story. If you don't, go we'll look it up in the Old Testament. They came back the next morning, and their stone God was on the ground. Because God said, I'm not going to put up with this. I'm the old true living God. You can't take me captive. If anything, I'll take you captive. So when you take captive the enemy, you usually display them for the world to see your God's more powerful. Jesus said, I took captive those who were captive by the evil one, and I have brought them into glory with me, and I'm you are my witnesses. You are the ones that were captive by the enemy, and I'm putting you on display for the world to see. You are my witnesses. You will be. It's not, a, not will, maybe. No, you are. I am. And what a joy as we understand the power of the gospel. Don't ever be ashamed of the power of the gospel. Please. You have no reason to be embarrassed when you tell someone Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That he'll forgive your sins. That you have a life after death. His spirit says those who believe that will receive the promises of God. So we have, we're in this mission. He's called us to join the disciples in this great commission. To declare his glory, to repent repentance and forgiveness in his name. He's been enthroned as the king of kings. Matter of fact, you can read the Psalms 110. Listen, I could give you a whole bunch of different Psalms to look at. There's Psalms 24, there's Psalms 110, there's Psalm 8, there's Psalm 67. These are some of the Psalms that predicted Jesus' ascension to his throne room. You can look at Daniel 7. My word, go read Daniel 7. I don't have time to get you through it today. Chapter 7, about 13 and 14. It talks about the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man and that His kingdom defeated all the kingdoms of the world. This was long before Jesus showed up on the scene. The prophecy of Christ. Ascension. It's a... Daniel 7 is looking at the same thing that the disciples are looking up. They're looking up and he's given a picture of looking down. And then jump over to chapter 3 and 1 of Revelation. It says Jesus' presence is walking around his churches now. 
And he's there to help us. He said, look, I see you slipping a little bit here, brother. If you've got ears to hear me, obey, repent. Oh, I see you over here. You're doing good work, but you, you've forgotten your first love. You've gotten tied up in doing too many things to impress the world, and you've forgotten my love. So he talks to all the different churches at different levels. Some of them are worse off than others. I can only imagine what he's saying to the church today. In the same way, taking the scriptures and pointing out our need to walk obedient unto him. So Jesus, oh, can okay, you think about the return to the Father? What a joy that had to be. I mean, y'all are so excited just to have social distancing visiting with somebody. But when he'd been gone, your son is back. He, oh, man, that, that scene, the angels had to be parting. Because Scripture says they longed to understand what it was all about. Why would the king of glory become humiliated and treated with such shame and discord? Why would you even do that for these people who are captives of the enemy? I, to get into that mindset, they don't understand salvation. They don't understand grace. And man, they couldn't wait for him to get back. And glorify him, worship him. Read Revelation. There's psalms of praise in Revelation. That are just exaltation and exaltation, adoration. And I love that song that came out, he, Is He Worthy? Chris Thomas come out with. And the answer, yes, he's worthy. Because that's really the argument. Who can fulfill the mission for us? That's what's happening. Who can do the will of God for us? And the answer was nobody. But the one who was slain, the son of David, steps forward. And takes the seal and opens it because he's the glorified man who can. That is glory, people. My good Pentecostal friends go, glory, glory. Right now is a glory time. Y'all might want to stand up in your home and glory Jesus. This is a glory time. When you start thinking about all that he does. He remains active, engaged in our world. What's happening today is no accident. Part of the divine sovereign will of God. I don't know all his purposes, but you can rest with confident assurance that he knows what he's doing. You can rest under the reality. Hebrews will tell you about the high priest in chapter 7 for about four chapters. All about the high priest that Jesus is. He is before the Father interceding. When he intercedes, it's not, oh, this is a good idea, Dad. No, this is what's going to happen. And I mentioned before that Peter would have fallen away just like Judas because they both denied the Lord. Peter representing actually all the disciples who denied him. And he said, I have prayed for you that your faith, once it's been sifted by the evil one, will be restored. It was Jesus' high priestly prayer that kept Peter. So we're preserved in the faith by his Praying right now. He's never, ever asleep. He's attentive to all that you're going through right now. And he says, bring them to me. Bring your request to me. Let me hear them. I'll work on your behalf. I'll use my authority, my kingdom authority and power to accomplish what needs to be accomplished in your life. Again, I think the struggle we, like the disciples, have, we make it, we want to make it earthly. We always want to make it earthly. We want it to come to fruition now. He says, no, I'll do it in your heart first. That's the kingdom of God. One day is what he's saying. I'm going to come back. I'm waiting for Dad to tell me to go. My Heavenly Father, my Abba, one day is going to say, Son, go get your children. Go set up your kingdom. I go with the, the host of heaven. And those who are dead in Christ, Scripture says, will rise and meet him in the air and will be where he is. Where he is is on earth. We're going to abide with him on earth in the new created order. Wow. And then you're going to get to explore the universe because you're going to be like Christ in the resurrected body. So there's hope for a glorious future. He will return as the judge and the king of all things. Psalm 110, 
told, God says to his son, sit here till I make your enemies a footstool for you. What an image. What an image of Christ standing on all the world. Boy, when you get over in Revelation, it becomes even more clear how devastating that is to them. You and I need the Spirit. We need His kingdom to come, His will be done. On what earth? The earth to come and the earth of our own being. Do it, Lord. Execute divine judgment. Vindicate your people who have been downtrodden and judged by enemies. That's what the psalmist said, constantly appealing to God to work on their behalf. So he's still the prophet. He's still the king. He's still the priest. He's still alive. And guess what? He's coming back again. He will be back. But we're not left alone. Ephesians talks about the prophets, the apostles, the teachers, the preachers. He gave gifts to all his people. You all have gifts that he uses for his kingdom's sake. Every one of us. There's no insignificant person in the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, Jesus says about John the Baptist, as great as he was, and even Moses, anyone who's a believer in him, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. The least. Somebody's got to be the least. I don't know who it is. Maybe it's me today. But still greater than these great prophets of God because of his ascension, his empowering us by his spirit, by his gifting us through the spirit to manifest these gifts and do ministry in his name, to accomplish the mission. That's good news, isn't it? I'm going to close with an application that John Calvin wrote about the ascension. This is Calvin's words. Thus, since he has gone up there and is in heaven for us, let us note that we need not fear to be in this world. It is true. We're subject to so much misery that our condition is pitiful. But at that, we need neither be astonished nor confine our attention to ourselves. Thus, we look to our head who is already in heaven and say... Although I'm weak, there is Jesus Christ who is powerful enough to make me stand upright. Although I'm feeble, there is Jesus Christ who is my strength. Although I'm full of miseries, Jesus Christ is in immortal glory and what he has will sometime be given to me and I shall partake of all his benefit. Yes, the devil is called the prince of the world but what of it? Jesus Christ holds him in check, for he is king of heaven and earth. There are devils above us in the air who make war against us. But what of it? Jesus Christ rules above, having entire control of the battle. Thus, we need not doubt that he gives us the victory. I am here, subject to many changes, which may cause me to lose courage. But what of it? The Son of God is my head, who is exempt from all change. I must then take confidence in him. This is how we look at his ascension, applying the benefits to ourselves. To Christ be the praise. Will you pray with me? So what of it? That's what we pray, Father. We clapped our hands to start the service. We sang your praise. For you have triumphed over every evil, every domain, every power. They've all been placed under your feet. And it's just a matter of time before it's finished. In the meantime, by your spirit, enable us to walk out in the benefits of ours in Christ. Always exalting Christ. Always realizing he is the author and finisher of our faith. That he always lives to intercede. He has all power and authority. He is our God-man before you. We praise you. We praise him. We praise the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Let's continue to worship and sing another song together in response to that.
uh, great news of the ascension of Christ. Why don't you start us off, Ian?
receive God's blessing. We call it the benediction. People of God, let us take up the mission Jesus left us to be, his witnesses. And may his grace, may his power, may his love, and the presence of the Spirit be with you all. Amen. Don't forget, go to Zoom. See you later.